Good evening. I'm David Cataforis, Professor and Chair of Art History at the University of Kansas. I would like to acknowledge that the University of Kansas resides on the ancestral territory of the Kaw people, who were forced off their land by the United States in the 19th century and largely relocated to Oklahoma. This acknowledgement recognizes Native Americans as traditional guardians of the land and the enduring relationship between Native peoples and these traditional territories. I'm pleased to welcome you to the, the latest lecture in the second year of our series, Intersections of Identity, Expression, Exchange, and Hybridity. The series asks, what constitutes identity? How do people navigate, form, and reform their sense of self? And how can the study of art and its history help us to consider the diverse identities expressed by visual culture and its creators? We seek to amplify the voices of scholars and artists whose work explores individual and collective identities as those intersect with notions of the body, disability, gender, heritage, and race. The series is organized by KU's Crest Foundation Department of Art History and our History of Art Graduate Students Diversity, Equity, Accessibility, and Inclusion Committee. It is sponsored by the Franklin Murphy Lecture Fund. We present it in partnership with the Spencer Museum of Art and the KU Department of Visual Art. The graduate students and I are grateful to Art History Department Office Manager Lisa Clore for all of her organizational help. And we acknowledge the creator of the poster for this evening's lecture, KU student Cormac Palmer. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Siona Benjamin. Ms. Benjamin describes herself as a B'nai Israel Jew from India, now living in the United States, and a Jewish artist creating cross-cultural and transcultural art. She says that her perspective bridges the traditional and the modern and sparks discourse across cultures. Many blue skin characters populate her paintings. She describes the blue skinned figure as a self portrait of sorts, taking on many roles through which she explores ancient and contemporary dilemmas. These characters enact their stories, often recycling myths from various cultures and religions, becoming symbols of a timeless global identity free of prejudices and boundaries. Ms. Benjamin immigrated from Mumbai to United States in 1986 and earned an MFA in painting from Southern Illinois University and an MFA in theater set design from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. She has exhibited widely in the United States, Europe, and Asia, and her art has been featured in more than 50 solo exhibitions and over 95 group exhibitions. She was awarded a Fulbright Fellowship in 2011 to India and a second Fulbright Fellowship in 2016-17 to Israel. Her work has received critical acclaim in the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Financial Times, the Boston Globe, Art in America, Art New England, Art and Antiques, Art News, Moment Magazine, the Times of India, the Mumbai Mirror, Mirror Marg Magazine, and other publications. Her multicultural art has also been featured in the Jewish Week in New York City and New Jersey, the Jerusalem Post and the Times of Israel and other publications. Ms. Benjamin has addressed audiences worldwide with keynote speeches, film presentations, panel discussions, workshops, lectures, and screenings of Blue Like Me, a 2015 documentary film that highlights her story and Fulbright work in India. That is also the title of her presentation this evening which will be followed by a question and answer session moderated by a member of the Graduate Students Diversity, Equity, Accessibility and Inclusion Committee. Please type your questions for Ms. Benjamin into the chat on YouTube, either during or immediately following her talk. I'm now happy to welcome and turn the screen over to Siona Benjamin. Good evening and um, wherever you are, good day to everybody. Thank you so much to the University of Kansas and all the team uh, for inviting me today for, uh, for a presentation of my work. Um, I, I, I'm going to give you an overall, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of a survey of what I have been doing recently 
but also I will talk a little bit about technique. It'll, I'll talk a little bit about, um, uh, you know, uh, how I make a living as an artist. And uh, I do this full time. Uh, I make a, a, a total living off um, through my art. And so I will share some of that too. I'll start off by sharing my screen. Um, So um, I, I can start off by saying, like David gave a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much, David. Um, I am um, a um, I'm a Bene Israel Jew from originally from India, and uh, people normally do not know that there were Jews in India. Well, there were about thirty thousand Jews growing up, and now there are about less than four thousand Jews left in India. But there are about over a hundred thousand Jews. Indian Jews in Israel. My family gradually dispersed mostly to Israel and America, but my parents remained in India. I'm also now an American living and working in New Jersey, but I still recall the ornate synagogues of my childhood, like the one you see over here, built by David Sasson, who was a very famous philanthropist and built synagogues, schools. The uh, Mumbai docks were, were named after him. And now it, then it was changed to Indira Gandhi docks recently. And so I still recall the ornate synagogues of my childhood, the oil lamps, the velvet and silver covered Torahs, a chair left vacant for the prophet Elijah in our Bombay synagogues. Having grown up in a predominantly Hindu Muslim society, being educated in Catholic and Zoroastrian schools, and that was because uh, Catholic and Zoroastrian, because my parents chose to give me, give me a proper, more, you know, a more British English education. Um, that's by choice. Some students, some uh, families don't send them, send their kids to more ver vernacular schools according to the language that they speak. So, um, and now then being raised Jewish in India and now living in America, I have always had to reflect upon the cultural boundary zones in which I have lived. And so I can expand and talk to you a little bit about what these cultural boundary zones are. Um, this is one synagogue. Here's another very famous synagogue built in the 1500s um, in south of India. It's a Cochin Pardeshi synagogue. There are about eight to nine synagogues in Mumbai and about uh, three synagogues in Cochin and uh, say two or three synagogues in Calcutta, one in Ahmedabad and the rest of India, there's one in Delhi. And so um, the rest of India does not have much of a Jewish pop population because the port cities is where the Jews were first came as traders over the centuries. Jews have been in India for over 2000 years. Here are some pictures from, I have a lot of uh, pictures from my family album. Like, so this is a day um, at the day at the Magin Hasidim Synagogue. Here is um, a, a very typical Jewish family portrait. This is my aunt, my mother's sister, and her entire family, her husband, her child. They all immigrated to Israel in the 1960s. Um, they live currently in Tel Aviv and Naharia era, area in Israel. Here's another very wonderful picture that I have from my family album. My mother is putting henna on the hands of her sister-in-law. So people always say henna and that's not Jewish. Well, it is because Sephardic or Middle Eastern, Indian, uh, Iranian, all those Jews, they have traditions which are influenced by their surroundings, their food, their culture is influenced by their surroundings. So yes, um, Middle Eastern, Indian Jews do have the ceremony of henna before the actual, the actual wedding ceremony. Here is the hands of a Jewish bride, for example, um, you know, from book from uh, the famous um, um, photographer Joan Roth. Um, I'm also in an exhibition with her right now, currently in New York. So I would like to, I thought to mention her. Um, this is a picture also from my family album. It is uh, my great great grandfather. Notice the turban, the long beard, the suit, and the and the Star of David that's hanging from his pocket. So these um, more oriental looking Jews, they um, wore turbans, which is was very common in Iran and Iraq and India and, and countries like that. And also the cultural melange of costume and of, of culture in general 
here are my parents in 1950. My mother's wearing a white sari. She's wearing uh, gold jewelry. She's got henna under her gloves of her um, kind of very British influenced sort of uh, little, um, you know, uh, you know, costume part over there where she's wearing gloves with a sari. And so this cultural mixture and melange was very common in in all aspects of life, whether it was food or whether it was uh, clothing and um, also the influence of British culture um, on Indian Jews was also there because they were also leaving to go to Israel. Here is a very new book that is out in the last uh, couple of months. Um, it's called Growing Up Jewish in India. It is edited by or Professor Ori Soltis from Georgetown University. And uh, there are contributors who, are, who have written about the three main uh, sects of Jews, the Cochini, the Baghdadi, and the Bene Israel. And I have written a chapter which is uh, kind of a memorabilia about what it was growing up Jewish in India and then Professor Soltis has written a chapter about how my work is influenced by my background. So this book is available on Amazon currently for more information about the Jews of India. So in my paintings, I combined the imagery of my past with the role I play in America today, making a mosaic inspired both, both by Indian Persian miniature painting. Here is an example of Indian, Indian miniature painting. It's particularly Hindu miniature where the goddess is slaying a dragon with the with the demon trapped in the body of the of the of the animal and then also i'm influenced by illuminated manuscripts which is uh, christian islamic jewish um you know buddhist all of the above um so in light of that i am, I, would, I can say that i am a transcultural artist i believe in transculturalism that will help in artistic and other ways to be a bridge between the traditional and the modern. This bridging not only affects recent immigrants in this country, but also Americans that have lived here for generations so that people can learn new ways to communicate and have artistic discourse with each other. So a transcultural person for me is rather like a chameleon being able to change his or her colors according to the situation and environment. Today's world politics pushes and promotes a need for a sense of belonging, a push to take sides, either black or white. The gray scale in between needs to be explored so that when we make final evaluations, it is made from the point of view of, um, you know, from the point of view of, of one's own um, sensibility or it can be painted from the fairness that allows us to learn from about all perspectives and not just one point of view. So being American can also be re-explored. This can be accomplished by being able to view the world outside of the bubble of one's own country, race, and religion. I believe that art can be an important vehicle in this endeavor. This involves not only presenting to my audience the uniqueness of immigrant cultures, but going beyond this and exploring what is born from the specifics of that immigrant culture. And I will try to explain to you a little bit more about what I mean by creating art that is born from the specifics of the immigrant culture. So not just making art which is a reproduction or a more nostalgic art, but something which is a kind of art which is recycled in a way, the mythology that is recycled in a way that it connects to today, today's politics, today's uh, issues that, that can be, can create a bridge to have this kind of dialogue and so um, is therefore born out of the specifics of one's immigrant culture. Um, I have a MFA, as David said, in uh, painting, but also in theater set design. Theater set design really influenced me a lot. Um, this is uh, one of my sets, The Skin of Our Teeth, an all-American play by Thornton Wilder, the, uh, the, uh, the model and the actual set. And then I've also done several other including operas i've done rigoletto for example and this is the actual set um so theater really influenced me the black box the storytelling the reading of the play uh the cre the creation of the set according to the atmosphere of what the play wanted us to do on stage was very influential on me learning how to also do that in my painting 
So therefore, I present you with an example of a Mughal miniature painting from 1700s. This woman is smoking a hookah in a very idyllic miniature painting scene. Um, in my painting, number 28, a figure myself in blue jeans, is seated in a traditional miniature landscape, is sipping coke through a long straw, which suggests the hookah. I am imbibing the intoxicating American elixir poison Coca-Cola, symbolizing the allure of the West, which draws me to reside in the U.S. In the background, the, the house says mother or ima in Hebrew and represents the home I was leaving when I immigrated to the U.S. There is a demon on top of the painting with a gun and a nuclear weapon suggesting that war will infiltrate and further disrupt the scene. So these are some of the things that are going on in this painting. I'm going to go on to another one. This is finding on number 56. It's titled Zakham, which actually means wound in Urdu, is inspired from a page in the Quran, but also from Jewish illuminated manuscripts. Are the swords a weapon that will descend on her, or are they a protection against unforeseen dangers? What seems like Urdu or Arabic writing above actually spells out it's unfortunate in English. So I like to mix up, you know, iconography and confuse the viewer and it looks like Arabic or Urdu, but it's actually something very simply written in English. Um, I like to do that in my work to create that kind of almost schizophrenic confusion. So um, because I feel that I belong from so many cultures that I feel it um, it comes naturally to me to be able to pick from all of these different specifics that I come from. Here's the bottom part of the painting. She's sleeping. She's got her red sari, which is nurturing the roots of the plants. And then inspired by, um, um, you know, a Mughal miniature like this, um, I have done this painting, a single Mughal miniature of the king holding the, the sword and the globe, uh, sister, is done in response to the Middle East crisis. Half Jewish and half Muslim, both her hands display the rich henna of their similarities. They seem peaceful, yet in front of them there is a blasting plunger and wires that indicate a bomb connected to them. Will they destroy themselves or will, or is there any hope that they will be saved from themselves? So I'm inspired also very much by, um, uh, by the Another sub-series that I did, I was inspired by the women in the Torah or by the mythologies of the women in the Torah. And it's a series of paintings called Farishte, which means angels in Urdu. I bring them forward to combat wars and violence of today's, um, you know, um, midrash or interpretation in these intricate paintings. It is through all this that I can dip into my own personal specifics and universalize, thus playing the role of an artist activist. I really, really believe that um, art is a picture can, is a thousand words and I feel the power of art ha gives me the power to feel that I can do that every day uh, when I wake up in the morning, that I feel it important to convey that through um, this image making, so to speak. I'll go on to the next painting. Uh, which is finding home number 74 is titled Lilith. So Lilith is based on Jewish legends. Lilith is the first Eve who was created at the same time as Adam. She was unwilling to forego her equality with Adam. Rebuffed, she took her case to God who responded to her seductive powers by revealing his divine name. She earned her ticket out of paradise and to, and to eternal exile. Thus, Lilith has been called a demoness and a serpent in the Garden of Eden. Lilith made a return in feminist history as an example of female strength and mystery. Roy Lichtenstein, so here she is actually, I'm influenced a lot by pop art. And so um, she is, you know, any woman that has been wronged, she comes, comes, comes back and asks for justice and for revenge. I'm influenced a lot by Roy Lichtenstein, the American pop artist, combined with uh, the drama of Indian Amar Chitra Katha comics. These are comic books that I grew up with. They're about Hindu mythology. 
They also talk about Islamic and Buddhist mythology, and they are all in English if you choose to. They come in many different languages. And I grew up with these along with the Disney comics and that I also grew up with and Tintin and Asterix from Europe. So I was lucky enough to get a very mixed melange of different cultures coming from Europe and America. So uh, Amar Chitra Katha are very, very um, influential in my arc, but also I grew up in Mumbai. My mother ran a a, a private school for 20 years and a lot of the Bollywood kids would come to her, her, her school. So I didn't realize this pop culture that surrounded me and now it is really comes back and I feel like I was, I was very, very much surrounded by very Indian pop culture, which was Bollywood, which also serves as an inspiration for my Lilith series. Indian Persian miniature paintings creep into the parts of the painting and the blonde heroine in Liechtenstein's paintings has been recast as a blue maiden. So um, this blue maiden, she um, comes forth in within from within this pop cultural influence. And in this painting, she says, you must save us from their wrath, which is which kind of, again, um, confuses the viewer as to who is us and who is them. Um, we don't know is us them and them us or do we really make those separations uh, without really thinking so um, I'm going to go on to uh, showing you a very new work an, a new, brand new Lilith that I just finished um, this one is uh, called Amistad a slave ship for a new century it is a triptych. I'm inspired a lot by the retablas, which I see at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, by Christian altars, um, by even Hindu temples when you enter the, 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 the consequence spaces one after the other to reach the, the main altar right inside the temple. So this is a triptych. Um, so it is based on the research of the concept of eugenics. And I'll tell you in a few lines what eugenics is. And, um, you know, I did not know much about it till I read more about it. And I was surprised to find out what it actually means. I have made um, a boat like triptych inspired by the medieval European retabla like structures, which open up to display Judeo, Judeo Christian themes. I, com I combined that with the idea of a boat, the slave ship. So looking at. Um, you know, pictures of um, the African um, slave ships that brought um, slaves to this country some 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 hundreds of years ago. Um, I thought about that whole structure, the central structure of this triptych, kind of like a boat. Um, and I combined that into the idea of a slave ship carrying numerous refugees, hopefully into safety from their countries and dictators of persecution. Many blue seated men sit packed in the golden boat, huddled, motionless, scared, yet hopeful. Lilith, who is Kali, who is also Medusa, always blamed for her cries of mercy and justice. Is this the moral and human condition of our era? The letter Shin, which is Shaddai, one of the names of God, an equivalent to the number 300 in the Hebrew alphabet represents divine power and potential peace. And it is actually portrayed on the top of her crown, her winged crown. It's the, the letter Shin, which symbolizes this. And to go on to telling you just a few lines about eugenics, eugenics is the philosophy and social movement that argues it is possible to improve the human race and society by encouraging reproduction by people or populations with desirable traits, termed positive eugenics, and discouraging the re reproduction by people with undesirable qu qualities. Um, this was started in the United States as early part of the 20th century. Um, it was um, included a systematic program for performing sterilizations on individuals without their knowledge, and um, it was supported and encouraged by a wide swath of people. And um, it was 
towards people who shared the goal of reducing the burden on society. The majority of people targeted for sterilization were deemed in, of inferior intelligence, particular, particularly poor people and people of color. So um, this was um, something that I found that pertaining to the current refugees also and uh, how we as gatekeepers are um, decide whether who comes in or not. Um, so this piece was um, for in regard to that. I also uh, work theatrically with blue dancers. Um, I am going on to another subject now um, where I uh, paint actual blue dancers and they act dance out parts of my paintings. Um, they are um, uh, they are wonderful to work with. They, um, I have uh, numerous dancers. Um, I also sometimes collaborate with theatrical companies according to the venue that I'm invited to and uh, they act dance out parts of my paintings in theaters, in galleries and museums. So you can say very often, I look at my skin and it has turned blue. It tends to do that when I face certain situations of people stereotyping and categorizing other people who are unlike themselves. I have therefore over the years developed many blue skin characters in my paintings. This blue self-portrait takes on many roles and forms through which I can theatrically explore ancient and contemporary dilemmas. In this process of recycling and rejuvenating, they merely remind me in making the work and hopefully my audience in viewing the work that myth making is cyclical and timeless. Thus, the blue skin has become a symbol for me of being a Jewish woman of color. And I would love to take more questions later on about this blue color. I'm going to move on now, um, checking the time a little bit. Um, I'm going to move on a little bit to how I make a living as an artist um, and share with you um, a few of my recent past uh, commissions. I do a lot of art commissions, uh, like for example, this one I've done seven six foot artworks for a Marriott boutique hotel. So there's one of each of these paintings on every floor of this particular hotel. Um, I also work for synagogues. Uh, this is, I do paintings and then the paintings are translated into many different mediums. Like in this case, it has been made into fabric for the parochet or the Torah um, arc cover and the amud, which is the table cover, which is in front of the Torah arc. I also work with other manufacturers. Like um, this example is I have my designs, my painting was converted into porcelain tiles and I work with a factory, a porcelain factory, where they help me convert my art into porcelain tiles into the 16 foot um, porcelain floor for a synagogue in St. Louis. Um, just to show you a variety of what kind of commissions I do, I just a few years ago, this is a slightly older one, where I did a commission for uh, where I illuminated uh, the Megillat Esther, which is the story of Esther which is traditionally done all over the world, but this commissioning um, person who was who owned a, um, a Judaica gallery on Fifth Avenue in New York wanted me to paint it in Persian miniature style. Here is the person who commissioned me, the gallery owner. And so it was done on real parchment and with gouache. And um, the calligraphy was done by a kosher scribe in Israel. And then very recently, my, one of my last commissions I finished was for a private home in Manhattan. Um, again, I work with the people who commissioned me on, on the theme, what they want, um, on the color. I work very closely with all of my commissioning people, whether it is I work with interior designers or I work with private uh, clients to see what they want for their space. I've done some furniture. This is a Torah arc where um, I designed the Torah arc. Um, my partner, who's a skilled carpenter, um, built the Torah arc and um, uh, then I painted it with 22 karat gold leaf and, and it's painted. So um, this is a piece of furniture. Very recently, I also designed tiles for a swimming pool for a private home. Um, so again, the same tile company, um, you know, helps me execute my designs onto high fired porcelain tiles that can be, you know, installed outside or inside and are practically ind in indestructible um, and will not fade in the in the sunlight or anything. So they are they're high fired tiles. 
And then also recently, I've, I got a commission um, to uh, illustrate a children's book. This is my first children's book. I'm going to be doing a second one sometime early next year um, after I finish the rest of the commissions that are lined up for this year. So I'm doing um, a, 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 another children's book with this book was on the song Hava Nagila. And this is the cover of the book. It is available on also on Amazon. So also, how does an artist make her work um, more accessible to general people, not just clients who are willing to pay a considerable amount of money? Um, I have uh, started, I have, uh, I have for the last few years um, a side business where I make silk shawls of my work and talit. And also I make yoga mats and other products like pouches. And so a wide range of um, merchandise is available on my website, Blue Like Me. So, and this is not for people who, you know, this is for people who cannot afford to buy an expensive painting. You could buy a print or you could buy a yoga mat and um, with the art on it and make art a part of your daily life. So that is a side business of mine in, in which way I can earn part of my living. Um, I'm gonna go on to another project, um, a concluding couple of projects uh, before we take questions. Um, as David mentioned earlier in my introduction, I have two Fulbrights. My first Fulbright was in India. And my first Fulbright was um, in 2011, where I conducted research and interviews with Jews in India, resulting in a collection of 40 photo collage paintings titled Faces Weaving Indian Jewish Narratives. The work will con continues to travel to numerous galleries and museums. And this, this um, project was also made into a documentary film um which was selected for numerous uh film festivals and i will show you some examples of what i did with this project so i went to india i interviewed um several indian jewish families there people uh, there are about as i said about four thousand families people four thousand people left um in 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 and around india um, very few in cochin mostly in mumbai and some in calcutta so here is an Indian Jewish family. Uh, and the, after I photographed them in various ways, I decided since I'm not a photographer, I wanted to, do, I wanted to make this project into photo collage paintings. So I brought the work home, I wrote for some more grants and I um, did a three by three feet sized photo collages and I painted on top of it. After interviewing the family and finding out what they had to say about their Indianness, their Jewishness, and what they had to share with me about their own story. I picked out the highlights of who they were and uh, put down my impressions about those people. So to give you another example, here is a wonderful portrait of an elderly gentleman who I photographed and unfortunately the following year he passed away, so I was very glad to get his photograph. Um, his family is in Israel right now and they were also Glad to see that I photographed him um, and videotaped him. So I cut out the faces like this on the computer with the help of my student assistants and interns. We put them on a photo collage, in this case against the synagogue that he prayed at every, almost every day that he came here in Pune. This is an Indian Jewish synagogue. Here's one of my student interns uh, learning how to gold leaf. And here is the final piece where um, we decided, you know, so every piece turned out to be that person's story. And um, um, here is um, another few examples. Here's an Indian Jewish bride. Uh, Karen Simon um, has had me photograph her for her henna ceremony, which was very delightful. And then I came back and I did, took numerous photographs of her her henna hands, I did a photo collage like so, and then I painted on top of the photo collage. I've made about 45 or so uh, pieces from the first uh, Finding Home, uh, from the first uh, Fulbright series, um, and um, they have been in many exhibitions. Uh, several of my exhibitions are traveling right now into, 
into four uh, solo shows to four museums in the Midwest. And some of the Fulbright works are in that um, in those shows too. Moving on to the Fulbright Israel project, which is from motherland to fatherland, transcultural Indian Jews in Israel. I completed my United States Israel Fulbright Fellowship to extend the current transcultural identity dialogue of Indian Jews in Israel. So in this case, um, I photographed different generations. Here's a grandmother and a granddaughter. And what was really interesting in the second part is that how the multicultural melange had taken place in Israel. So here is a Kuchini Jewish grandmother with her granddaughter who is part Bene Israel, part Kuchini and part Ashkenazi. So the cultural mix, mixtures that happened in these family was very interesting. Here is my cousin Romiel with his son uh, who is half Kuchini and half uh, Bene Israel. Here are daughters of some of my other cousins. Um, this cousin particularly had married a Yemenite Jew. So here is uh, their one of two of their five daughters who is uh, their half Bene Israel Indian Jews and half Yemenite Jews. And then here is another wonderful example of Ilana and her daughter Zohar. Um, Ilana is an Indian Bene Israel Jew and her daughter is um, half Indian Jew and half Romanian Jew. So um, this wonderful cultural melange and the mixture of cultures that has happened in Israel was very interesting for me to photograph and interview. Here's another last example of um, um, of a father and a son, both are Bene Israels. He's a Bene Israel Jew, his son is Bene Israel too. Um, so with 3D prints, so I'm going to, with this project, I'm going to make 3D lenticular prints. The faces, stories, and heritage of this ancient culture will be documented and exhibited. These faces are like maps linking me to the memories and weaving narratives. It is with these people and their stories that the rest of the world has an opportunity to learn about Indian Jews. With this project, I hope to educate in this divided and tenuous times, and in the process, as an immigrant artist, find home again. So I am um, hoping, I have not finished this project as yet. Each one of these lenticular prints will be two by three feet. I'm still writing some more grants. I've done some of them, but they are very expensive to make. And so I'm slowly completing this project. Though my India project has been completed and exhibited several times, including it has been exhibited at the Prince of Wales Museum in Mumbai. So the Fulbright had me come back and exhibit there. And my community there got to share in the exhibition, uh, the final product too. So that was very inspiring and wonderful for me. So, um, and then this project, um, I'm still completing it. And there, so there'll be two faces, two generations or three generations, one on top of the other. So when you move from side to side on the picture, like a 3D picture, you will see both faces in one picture. And last of all, um, this is just a, a little, um, you know, some examples of my work. Um, I would invite you to visit my website at artsiona.com and my merchandise website at Blue Like Me. And I look forward to questions from the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Siona. I believe Rachel Quist is going to join us. Hi. Hello. Um, thank you so much for your talk, Siona. I learned so much and I know our audience did as well. Um, we have a couple questions accumulating in the chat, so I'll, I'll, give, uh, I'll give precedence to our audience. Um, and then I might, I might be a little bit selfish and ask a few later. <laughs> um, so uh, one question from Logan is uh, could you discuss more about how you designed or uh, slash created your Anglo-Urdu script and what was that process like? Oh, you mean to say that little hybrid script that I made mm, I in one of the that. paintings? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, well, um, I have some paintings like that where the speech bubbles on top of the paintings actually are like a mix of five different languages since I can speak uh, 
of course, English, um, which, you know, I went to British schools in India. I know Hindi, Marathi, some Urdu, uh, you know, a little bit of Hebrew, a little bit of French. So, you know, I sort of, um, I feel like I belong everywhere, nowhere. So I feel like confusing the viewer when they ask me where you're from. That's a very, very typical question I get. Where are you from? You know, uh, they can't place exactly where I am from. So. I have sometimes say I'm from India and then they assume that I'm one of the major religions. And when I say I'm a Jew from India, so they either, you know, fall over in disbelief or, <laughs> they, say, or they say, you know, um, well, I've heard of those people, you know, I mean, yeah, tell me more. So um, I kind of created this sort of hybrid imagery of the blue characters and also then hybrid imagery of uh, a new language you know kind of almost not every time used but sometimes used so that i can um, sort of you know like i said confuse the audience so it people have come up to me and said what is that what does that profound word mean and i'm like nothing it it means it says it's unfortunate and they're like oh my god really yes it does <laughs> say that and then i say why is it unfortunate and i said well i might have been reading the newspaper that morning and i might have found another unfortunate piece of news over there. And I might have said, oh, this is so unfortunate. And then I came into my studio and I was doing that painting and I said, what should I write there? And so I wrote, it's unfortunate, you know? Um, so it's sort of like spontaneous kind of reactions to things sort of um, help me create the, the dialogue, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that actually connects to a couple of the questions. We've had a couple questions about the color blue. So I'll pick one from Mary Frances and we had a similar one from Logan as well. Um, could you share more about the significance of blue for you? Uh, would another color have done? Have you considered other colors uh, and concluded blue is more successful for your goals? And then um, just really quickly because of the, the specific wording of it, um, Logan also asked, uh, could you discuss how the issue of skin color slash colorism influences your work? Mm -hmm. So these are all interrelated. I can repeat any of them if you want. I realized that was that was a lot. So. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, so the color blue um, mm -hmm. is, I mean, I was thinking for the longest time when I was painting these sort of like theatrical scenes, like after coming out of theater school, I realized that I'm a storyteller. I'm, I mean, I'm not, I, I love doing abstract paintings, but I love storytelling. I like delicate feminine storytelling works. And so embracing that, number one, was a big thing, you know, and not following the rules of what you're taught in graduate school or something like that. So coming to terms with that and then realizing that um, it was very important. Um, and then uh, realizing also the characters. I want to create characters like story in the storytelling. And so I started looking, I started studying with a rabbi and he said, I started studying Midrash. And at first when I was approached by this rabbi to say, you should study Midrash. I said, uh, I don't like to do religious work. Like he said, this got nothing to do with religion. It is about recycling mythology. And around the same time I had read the book, The Power of Myth by, by Joseph Campbell. And that further reinforced my feelings about how mythology was so important or the recycling of mythology would be so important for me. And um, so when I started creating the characters and I started thinking about how would they look and I looked at Indian miniature paintings and pictures from my family albums of my ancestors and trying to make a melange of all of these kind of influences. And then it came to the question of skin color as to what shade of brown I should paint this character. And I tried all different shades and I was like, you know, then I tried purple and I tried, and I thought, then I came with blue, Krishna is blue, many Indian avatars are blue, but it's got, it's, it, I felt it should go sort of beyond that. It, it should go, it, how do I make it my own? That was important, very important thing for me to try to, uh, you know, grapple with. I mean, I don't want to copy any culture, even though I come from it and I own it or I, I can claim it, so to speak. So I came up with a shade of blue and I experimented with the different shades of cobalt blue or turquoise blue. And I thought the turquoise light blue was the color of the sky and the ocean. And so it was such a neutral color that it made me feel comfortable belonging everywhere. 
And yet sometimes I feel like I'm in a situation and I don't fit in at all. So I belong nowhere. And so that became the sort of um, very happy color for me to be able to create my characters in. And um, the second question was? Um, so uh, could you discuss how the issue of skin color slash colorism influences your work um, and how that might pertain to blue if, if it does? Right. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, color is really important for me in my work. Um, I, I especially I use gouache and 22 karat gold leaf, especially. And I think uh, those come very close to the gem like colors that you see in illuminated manuscripts and uh, in Persian and Indian miniature paintings. The traditional way of painting is on like handmade paper with very uh, organic colors, which I sometimes go to Jaipur and I have this one teacher there and I sit cross legged in his studio and I, you know, learn some more little tricks from him. I spent a week, couple of weeks with him and his wife serves me tea, you know, continuously. <laughs> um, and so it's really nice to, uh, to spend time with him, but I, I don't have the time or the energy to do that. So I use gouache paints and so color coming from India, it doesn't make you shy of color. I mean, you know, there was a photographer a while ago that said, um, I forget his name, this beautiful picture of this beautiful brown skinned man with a pink turban. And he says, pink is the navy blue of India. You know, so it's like, you know, who would wear that shocking pink turban? But in India, you see all those colors and nobody is afraid of color. And so um, trying to, draw those same colors that that are eye candy for me is really important and um, has therefore people have asked me like um, you know how do you make that color you are on something you know so, I mean I say no <laughs> you know it's just uh, it comes almost naturally to to make layers of color with the gouache and the layers of color create that gem like quality yeah well we actually just um, we have some other questions, but uh, another one, since we're talking about blue, came in from uh, Professor Marnie Kessler, who asked, uh, or who wrote, I also think of blue as having a theological connection in Judaism. Yes. Does that factor into your uh, decision to use blue? Yes. Uh, yeah, I should have mentioned that. Um, the tzitzit is blue, the talit is blue, the, the synagogues in India, for some reason, are that turquoise blue. Maybe that's stuck in my brain. Um, and then also there's like blue pottery everywhere. It's just, you know, creatively blue has been used by so many cultures and mm -hmm. that beautiful turquoise color. So, you know, um, my eyes kind of crave that sort of gem like blue, you know, whether it's going to see the water in Hawaii or, you know, the waters in the Mediterranean. It's just, uh, I, I really am drawn to that intense color of blue. and. It gives me a, um, I, I think I have convinced myself that that color is, is kind of so universal and neutral, but at the same time, so specifically mine. So it is everybody's color. <laughs> Everybody can claim it, but this particular blue, I have, I think, managed to make a little bit my, my own. Yeah, I had also when I when I saw Professor Kessler's question, I, I had immediately thought of for anyone in the audience who's not aware of those terms, talit, the tzitzit, uh, the talis is a is a prayer shawl that that uh, is used in Jewish prayer, and the tzitzit are these uh, tassels um, that are uh, that are uh, hanging from the four corners, uh, and it's. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Siona, if my memory serves, the there's a textual background uh, for when the tzitzit are prescribed in the in the Torah that a, spe a specifically blue dye is to mm -hmm. be used for them. And I noticed the talis or the talit uh, throughout your work, and so I wondered actually myself mm -hmm. if there was a connection between the blue of the tzitzit and the blue of the of the figures. Yep. There's also various blue, blue uh, wonderful blues in um, in Kabbalah and mm -hmm. uh, the in the Sefirot, which is the tree of life. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, some connections over there also are really interesting you know like uh, uh, you know some of them are, are related to different colors and so right now I'm actually doing a commission for another synagogue in St. Louis and uh, I'm making the um, the Torah curtain for them and I'm looking into color again and looking into the colors of the, of the sefirot to uh, you know uh, match the different parts of the sefirot to the different colors so um, it's very interesting to kind of make those different kinds of connections. <laughs> yeah. Well, we had a question from, um, from Maggie who, uh, wrote, thank you so much for your fascinating talk. Have Indian and Israeli audiences responded differently than U.S. audiences to your artworks, especially regarding your theme of transculturalism? Right. Um, I think most of my audience has been here in the US because I think, I don't know, Professor David can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think the concept of transculturalism and the exploration of the topic of, of, of transculturalism has far advanced here. And so there is a hunger for understanding what is this hybridity, trans, this transculturalism. Um, I think it is more so happening also in Israel because um, Israel has learned to embrace its diversity um, after some initial not so good years of managing to do that because there are Jews of color who were not accepted or you know were were treat, treated not so well by Ashkenazi Jews because and so diversity now in Israel has been accepted much more much better and in India the diversity was always there like, I mean, there's like, what, 16 languages and 52 dialects, and there's so many influences, Mughal, Hindu, Buddhist, Parsi, Zoroastrians coming from Iran, you know, all these different, you know, Vasco da Gama coming and Alexander the Great coming and influencing the whole Gandhara period of sculpture several centuries ago. So there's so much of melange over there already. So I think I got the basis of understanding what transculturalism was, was from this childhood that I spent there. But I think um, they almost I think in India, they almost in a way I feel take it for granted, um, you know, and here because we are in the new world, so to speak, you know, in America, in a newer world, we are almost exploring it in a different way. And so um, I have had a few exhibitions in India, but not too many. And also but partly also that's because most of my family is not in India. They are mostly in Israel. So I've had more contact with Israel now than I do with India. Um, my parents are no longer there. So, you know, uh, my connection to India is slowly diminished, unfortunately. So, Well, on that topic of transculturalism, we had uh, one or two questions from Logan. I'll ask them in turn just because uh, I don't want to risk one question being lost in the other. Um, so uh, Logan asked, would you discuss the issue of cultural essentialism as it relates to your work and philosophy of transculturalism? And uh, specifically, how can we cross cultures without uh, defining them strictly? Right. Uh, very good question. <laughs> very complex question. Um, the the crossing of cultures i think um is is happening as we speak and will continue to happen um many years ago i forget i think in the 80s the this just came to mind um i think it was time magazine that came up with a computer generated face of what a, a multicultural face a combination of different cultures would look like you know, um, in the future. And I still remember that face. And um, I think I even looked it up like a little while ago because I was discussing it with some other person and it just came back to me, believe it or not. I mean, I look back at it, maybe it just stuck in my mind, but that face looks so much like my daughter. She's 26, she's half Indian Jew, she's half Russian Polish. And now she's in Israel, you know, she's she's a culinary chef. She just became a chef and she's exploring her Indian Jewish roots in Israel right now as we speak. And that face is just, you know, such the future of what 
of what we all are, this hybridity that people are trying to compartmentalize and try to stop is not going to be successful by them. It's not possible. Um, so just just living it and experiencing it and, you know, acknowledging it is one way, I think. Um, and then I think expressing it like through the art, uh, there are many artists doing that now and uh, very successfully. And I think uh, that makes it very exciting to to see, um, you know, these mixtures of cultures that take place. Now, people have sometimes asked me, can you like use somebody else's art without really, you know, owning it or without really um, understanding it? That's, you know, the cultural appropriation, so to speak, um, which I'm going slightly div I'm diverging from his question, but, you know, it kind of goes hand in glove. Um, the um, I think appropriation is something that is a problem if you take from another culture without really understanding it, but just take it because it's cool and I want it. But I think I have so many American friends actually who, for example, have lived in India for and really, you know, you know, embodied embodied that culture into their work so much that they own it and they and they can claim it and they can use it. Uh, and you can make out the difference when it's superficially taken by somebody and when it is actually studied and really ingested. So I don't know if that really answers the very complex question that was asked. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the, the, there was a second kind of part to that, which uh, a continuation, I'll say. So Logan also asked, by transing uh, culture in your work, uh, or in transing culture in your work, do you feel that you are creating a new culture, something singular and definable, or something more plural and ambiguous? Um, and then what should be the goal of uh, transcultural work? Mm, wow, that's interesting. Um, so I feel, uh, well, I feel that in in my quest for, you know, trying to find my voice or my style um you know that every artist searches for you also find out kind of who you are i mean like who you who you really are and i think that is the existential question that a lot of people ask whether you're an artist or not like you know what am i what am i here for so to speak um, so earlier on, I felt like I was um, asking that a lot because I felt that I wasn't finding who I was, so to speak, and what was my voice or my language. And so I felt, well, I might as well be useful doing something else, <laughs> you know, maybe art education or maybe, uh, I don't know, um, social service or something, I don't know, something that would be, or, you know, something which would be more useful. And then uh, when I continued to um, for that really hard quest for that for my voice and my language so to speak and um, I stumbled upon it and I felt like um, I think I'm getting warmer <laughs> to <laughs> to something that I feel I want to do for the rest of my life and not feel all the time that um, uh, what am I doing why am I doing this I rather do something else. I want to retire. Well, <laughs> I don't want to retire anymore because I mean, what do I go to do when I retire? I want to paint till I die, and you know, I mean, so that that feeling is something that um, unfortunately just came about, and um, um, it was it was a hard it was a hard um, quest, you can say. A um, lot of truths to be answered. Um, but I think um, um, does my work, I, I hope that my work, I don't know, I hope that my work will aim, will take from the specifics, like I said, and aim to becoming more universal. And I feel it, it, it I get very rewarded, of course, when I somebody buys my work and whatever, but I get even more rewarded when somebody from a totally different background comes and tells me, I can identify with your work because of this, this, and this. I feel the same way. I feel blue because of this. And this person doesn't have to come from my culture or my background or my religion, 
but can identify with the with being different in their own way and that is i feel then successful when that story is replayed in somebody else's life in a different way does that answer part of the question or you want to repeat part of it so well, i can get the rest I of think, it i think that covers it wonderfully and and we have so many other uh, people jockeying to ask you questions that I uh, I should move on to those. We have um, we have a question from Catherine White, which I think also pairs nicely with a question from Mary Frances. It's about practice, uh, your professional practice. So Catherine wrote, um, thank you for sharing your work. I was interested to hear about the many media you've worked in and the different audiences you've made art for, including your experience with theater and children's books. Um, so the, what has it been like translating your artistic interests for different audiences is what Catherine wrote. And then I think Mary Frances's question is a good kind of uh, combination with that because Mary Frances wrote, um, uh, since you work closely with uh, commissioners, could you elaborate on what those conversations are like and have those experiences informed your uh, Siona Ware designs? So, yeah. <laughs> so commissions are uh, very interesting and I really love them. I've grown to really, really love them. I mean, people say, is it something that you have to do? Well, I mean, I do earn my a big part of my living through that way. Um, and I'm lucky to get like a wide variety of commissions, everything from children's books to swimming pools, <laughs> you know, um, it makes it very interesting. And therefore the person commissioning me and the client I feel is really important. Um, I also feel one thing which is really important. I think artists who want to do something like this should learn uh, good communication. I'm still learning to be a better communicator. I'm not saying that I am the best, but I, I really try my best to be a good communicator. Um, it's really important because, um, you know, it's like when you run a shop, you know, customer is king, right? Same thing, same philosophy. The client is really important. And um, when you communicate with the client, the better it is and the more satisfactory results you get. You can put your foot down with the client and say, no, I can't do that because it's not going to look good. And the client generally listens to you because they know that you are the expert. <laughs> but, you know, um, also listening to the client as to what they want and listening to their story as to, you know, whether it is working with an interior designer or a private client, whether it's working with a publisher or it's working with um, a landscape architect, like I did the swimming pool for. It's it's very important to understand um, the client and to communicate. So communication is very, very important. And um, I think a lot of artists are, you know, we tend to be uh, introverts and we want to be left alone and we want to do our own work. So when I do my own work, I like to be left alone and I really enjoy that part. But when I do commissions, I love going out and meeting people and having communication with them. So when I'm doing a commission, for example, I will keep in contact with the client and I'm, I set it up in a way that the client pays me as I show progress. So that initiates me to keep doing the progress and the client then gets a chance to give me like a sign of sort of a monthly salary till I finish the project. Um, and I get the last payment after the after the commission is delivered. So it, I also have contracts. I make it very professional. Um, I give exact dates. I try to stick to my dates. So, you know, I, 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 I try to make sure that the client is really happy in the end with the, with the end result. So, um, I mean, that's about commissioning. And there was another part to it. No. Yeah, um, so from Catherine White, uh, uh, directing to the kind of theater and, and children's books and the other kind of, um, I suppose, narrative uh, projects uh, such as those, um, what has it been like to translate your artistic interests for different audiences? Um, well, the children's book, I mean, I learned, this was my first children's book, I learned a lot. I had a good publisher and a good designer of the book. So it was very interesting. The author was in Canada. The designer of the book was in Spain 
and the uh, publisher was in Seattle and I'm in New Jersey. So, you know, we had different time zones. We would have uh, quite a lot of meetings and I was guided through the whole project of how to make a children's book. I didn't know the meaning of, you know, don't paint in the gutter and leave so much, you know, area on the side. So all the specifics of making a children's book and painting the pages was very informative. And my first children's book, I was paid well and I was guided well. So I was lucky. Um, my second children's book that I'm starting next year also I'm very excited about, um, you know, was with a bigger publisher and I'm excited to start that. So um, I learned a lot from my first children's book and I'm hoping that I will, I'm now excited to do more. I feel the experience was very good. Any other kind of things like I have to work like the, the hotel commission, I have to, had to work with an interior designer and what he wanted and his singular vision for what the artworks were in the hotel in general, keeping in mind that I had to uh, learn to make uh, project presentations where I had to, you know, do um, like a whole um, PowerPoint presentation as to what the project will be like. Uh, so I learned a lot about that too. Um, I also get student interns from different universities that intern with me, so they are a great help to help me with these projects. I have three student interns this semester from the local university, so um, one in marketing and two in uh, in art and design. Um, so um, they are helpful in helping me too. Um, yeah, so I mean, every commission you learn something new, definitely. And one has to be open to that and not say, you know, I'm an artist, so it's going to be my way. Your style is going to come through. And if you have the confidence that you in your in yourself and in your style, then there's no worry that somebody else is going to try to crap that, you know, so um, the the beauty is to go along with the with what comes your way through the commission. Well, thank you so much. Um, Catherine's question uh, ca kind of got me also thinking about the, the importance of narrative. Uh, and you talked about your background in theater as well. Um, so I was just thinking as well about the paintings that you so kindly shared with us tonight. And um, I one question that's been on my mind, I was wondering um, how you what which figures from 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 stories and in mythologies who are the figures that kind of grab your attention or who inspire you to create um and and do you think that there are kind of like specific types of people or can it be kind of how you're feeling that day you know um like i said before i studied midrash which got me thinking about so Midrash is not anything about religion, like God is like a character in there, you know, it's not like, you know, he's put on a separate pedestal. And the characters in there are, um, it's very soap opera like and very melodramatic and, he, and it's very colorful and there's every form of, you know, of melodrama in there. And so I think uh, those were like the basic stepping stones for me to understand uh, mythology and my favorite characters are, um, for example, Lilith. I talked about her. Um, I also like, you know, uh, I'm doing a project right now with uh, with a. It's called the Amen Institute, and they have paired. Um, I don't know. It's the thing. Twenty three artists with twenty three scholars, uh, Jewish studies scholars and rabbis, and so. We get to, so I got my rabbi and I got the portion that I got was about Miriam and Zipporah. And it was, I don't know whether they, they purposely gave me that 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 part, the chapters 12 in, in numbers, because that part is about Miriam and Zipporah being the Kushite woman, the, the Isha Kushit, which is the, the black skinned woman, wife of Moses. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of uh, theology and writings about uh, Isha Kushit and why Miriam called her the black woman and just not Moses's wife. And so, you know, you know, is there racism implied there? What is the meaning of that? You know, she was not from the um, Hebraic tradition. She was a Mennonite and I mean, she, she was she was a, she was from the Midian tribe. Sorry. And so she, you know, then she 
bears two sons for Moses, but then what happens to that character, you know, and as she described as the black skin is very interesting and the dialogues and the midrash and the writings that have been written by, I don't know how many people, like I was in my last exhibition and the professor then sent me a flood of articles on the, on, <laughs> on, uh, on the topic of the, the black skinned wife of Moses, which is very interesting. So it becomes, it goes beyond the mythology it's, you know, the mythology and story is there, but it's connected to today. I mean, Isha Kushit, the, the concept of that can be tied into Black Lives Matter and into so many things which are contemporary and topics which are today, which is incredible. So mythologies recycle itself and they, you know, they kind of repeat itself in a way and it can be connected to today. Hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I uh, I noticed I overlooked a question because of this flurry. I, I missed a question from, from uh, Logan who asked, uh, could you talk a little bit more about ornament uh, slash decoration in your work? Right. Um, I also found earlier on, and I had to come to terms with that because in graduate school, you're told, um, you know, you're normally, I mean, at that time in the, in the 80s and the 90s where I went to school, graduate school, I was told, you know, that ornament or centering your work in the composition of your work or decorativeness is something which is not high art. It's something more folk-like, folk art, or it is maybe um, coming from cultures that are decorative and therefore not high art. And so you have to create art like Robert Rauschenberg and you know, uh, Mark Rothko, and I love those people's works. Like, you know, I studied them and I even painted large abstract paintings for a while. But um, that was another coming to terms with where I feel I had to come to terms with the fact that I love the lyrical line. I, 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 I like abstract art, but I also love the decorative lyrical line. And that was coming to terms with myself that I want to do it. And that what is something that is in me and my DNA, in the India that I come from, you know, uh, came with that ornament. And so, um, and what's wrong if I center the work in my composition, you know? Um, it doesn't have to have the Western imbalance in the composition that I was told that is, is makes a higher grade of work, you know? So sometimes I can do that, but sometimes I can also center the work. Yeah, I mean, how much of what is considered, you know, new and current, contemporarily good in art is just kind of rehashing what is, you know, or not rehashing, that's not polite, um, but just basically uh, using design principles that are rooted in Western ideals of beauty and overlooking non uh, not, not non-western ideals of beauty or or of 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 what is you know appealing that come from outside of you know euro american cultures and so i'm i'm so glad that um that that kind of appreciation for centering images and for you know using ornamentation are, are coming through and, and 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 receiving space um i mean uh, my my undergraduate thesis in the art school in india i went to a wonderful art school in mumbai the JJ School of Art, and my undergraduate thesis was space division and color analysis in Indian miniature painting. So I kind of learned composition, the abstraction of composition by taking away all the figures and all the um, trees and the people from an Indian miniature painting and just painting the flat, the flat spaces that the composition made up of. And it became for me these beautiful abstract paintings. And then adding on elements to it came later on. But learning composition from this tradition of Indian Persian miniature was something that I was very interested in from the very beginning. And um, I felt like I look at a Mark Rothko painting and the beautiful color that dances in that, in that work is just as beautiful as, you know, the jewel-like color that I want to create, you know, that is alive and, um, and is breathing, <laughs> you know, so. One thing I, I really enjoy as well, uh, thinking about kind of moving between different genres and cultural styles and, and time periods is, is taking 
um, inspiration from min miniatures and then putting them on this monumental scale as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask actually about the painting behind you. Um, oh, yeah. I, 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 I actually, it's, this is partially my, my own background in, in, in Buddhist art coming through, but uh, it almost, uh, it, well, the pose reminds me of uh, a Pari Nirvana scene, but um, mm -hmm. I, I know that that's not the only place that someone would lie on their side. Um, right, so, right. Yeah. You're absolutely correct. I was, I'm, I'm inspired by the sleeping Buddhas in Thailand, those hundred foot long golden Buddhas that you find in, in Sri Lanka and Thailand. So I looked at those and I thought, um, you know, I want to do a Lilith sleeping like that, but like it's sort of a reaction maybe to the Me Too movement where don't wake the sleeping giant Lilith, you know. Um, so it then the, the position of the sleeping Buddha gave me inspiration to be able to draw, uh, to be able to paint a contemporary lying down woman who is Lilith and who's today's woman asking for justice. So don't wake the the sleeping giant, you know, you could, it could be some problem. So, you know, so, um, so I wanted to, she's about eight foot long in, in length. And so I'm still finishing her. I do these paintings. This is not a commission. I do these paintings in between my commissions. So if I'm doing my commissions for like five days, I'll take two days off and do my own work too. <laughs> so. Well, uh, David, I don't know if you had any any questions. Um, I've think... just been enjoying listening <laughs> to the questions and the answers. It's been a wonderful conversation. Yeah. Uh, Rachel, do you have any anything else? There's one thing I wanted to ask, and I, I intended fully to ask this at the beginning of the Q&A section, another, just another case of, um, of uh, making sure everyone in the audience knows our terminologies that we're using tonight. If I could trouble you to, to help folks understand um, the term B'nai Israel, because I think a lot of folks aren't necessarily familiar with the, the various uh, cultures that exist within the Jewish diaspora and and probably most people just know Ashkenazi and Sephardi and maybe Mizrahi um, but could you tell us a bit more about uh, B'nai Israel? Sure um, you could find a lot more about it in my new book The Growing Up Jewish <laughs> yeah because there are many uh, there are many experts that have written chapters on each one of the so there's B'nai Israel, Cochini, Baghdadi and now there's the B'nai Manashe which are also a more recent group in India, which is fairly recent that claim Judaism. But the, the first three, the Cochini, the Baghdadi, and the Ben Israel are the three oldest groups. Um, the Cochini and the, and the Ben Israel came 2000 years ago. Uh, traders, uh, they were called Radonites. They came trading for spices and opium and all of that. Um, and the Baghdadi Jews, were in the Middle East to begin with their mom is Rahi there from Iraq and Iran. And so like David Sasson was one of the uh, people, one of the philanthropists that came and traded for all of the all the spices and all of the above and the Silk Route, the you know, the Jewish traders that came from the Middle East, even from Yemen and came to South India. So there's some Yemenite uh, mixtures of Jews in South India, too. And then they went all the way to China. So there is even a, a synagogue in Kaifeng, China. Um, so this is because it resulted in all the Jewish traders and traders in general going all the way through, you know, um, India into China. Um, so the Bene Israel are um, been in India for 2000 years. I think DNA wise, um, I am um, like my grandmother, my mother's mother was a Jew born in Quetta, Pakistan. Um, so near the Afghani border, and uh, she came and married my Jewish grandfather, David, in India. And uh, I have a family tree of my mother's that goes back eight generations of all Jewish um, traditions and people and names. And, um, um, and so it's, it's and, and I'm lucky to have that family tree, especially on my mother's side. My father is also a Ben Israel Jew, and um, uh, there were, um, they came the, the wonderful mythological stories of how they were shipwrecked and they came from Yemen and from the Middle East and from Israel. But I think, I mean, they probably, you know, I love those beautiful stories and I'm actually going to illustrate one of them sometime soon. Um, uh, they probably came from Iran and Iraq, some, you know, obviously like every culture, 
they come people come to different countries there is going to be some mixtures and melanges of cultures and people and um, so the same thing with the Cochini Jews they came mostly to Cochin and um, Portuguese came to India Yemenites came to India so and the Baghdadis were more recent like maybe 300 years or so three four hundred years and um, they came mostly from Iraq so um, <laughs> thank you um... I guess maybe a closing question. Um, one of the other times that I, I saw you speak, um, one of the topics that came up in conversation was uh, Tikkun Olam. And, and I know you have a painting called Tikkun HaOlam. And um, for, for anyone not familiar, it's this concept, and I'm sure you'd speak more eloquently about it than I would, but a concept of, of fixing, improving the world. Um, and I was just wondering if you could tell us a bit about what that concept means to you and, and how it manifests in your, in your art as well and in your practice. Sure. So just like um, realizing things about ornamentation or about mythology, the one other thing that I learned and was really changed my whole course of thinking is the concept of tikkun haolam. And uh, uh, to really understand it, I, I felt like um, I had to study it a little more and I felt that it really resonated with me because tikkun is, um, so the whole world is compared to a perfect pot, right? And um, we couldn't save that perfect pot because of our imperfections. So this pot shattered and the shards went all over the world and these holy sparks, so to speak, are and it's our duty as human beings to put those shards back together again and to make that pot, you know, glue that pot back again. And, and that glued up pot is even more virtuous, is even more valuable than the original perfect pot because of your, um, because of your, um, you know, uh, all of your uh, efforts to put it back together again. So I started thinking about uh, tikkun as being a basis to my art because I feel that gave me the reason that I will make images that will be that glued up pot, that will be um, contributing to the concept of tikkun and that offering. And that again gave me a direction and a reason to wake up in the morning and feel excited about my work that it might be a drop in the ocean, but it is my little contribution. And, um, you know, whoever will take it, I will be so happily, you know, giving it to them. Um, that really, really, really affected my, my thinking and um, th gave me a lot of validation in my work. So, um, yeah. That's that's a wonderful way to to end this evening, Siona. Thank you so much, Rachel, for asking that particular question, which I think was so uh, beautiful and sort of summing up your philosophy that that comes through your art in 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 such vivid and and visual ways. But but we we appreciated also hearing you speak about it, and again um, engaging in this uh, conversation with our audience. So many wonderful questions tonight. Uh, so much for us to uh, to think about. And I know that we're all going to want to explore your art further, you know, on your website and, and maybe even somebody will want to buy a yoga mat. So <laughs> uh, we, uh, yeah, yeah, I see one. So we, uh, we, we so appreciate you uh, spending this time with us and, and um, sharing your work and thought with us. And, and we wish you the best um, in your continued creative pursuits uh and and um just thank you again and and wish our audience a good evening yeah thank and you just, so much i just want to because because the audience can't can't tell you just a lot of thanks from the audience as well so yeah and my gratitude thank you so much thank you so much for inviting me i really appreciate this and wonderful questions thanks so much and with that uh we will go off of the live